Amen. Amen. But I'm excited. I'm excited to bring the word today. And uh, if you're like, dang it, Pastor Jason's not here, don't worry. We'll get through this together. It'll be all right. I, I promise you it won't, it may not be as good as PJ, but it won't be terrible either. So, so uh, that's, that's my best, my best pitch. But, uh, but we're going to go on a journey today. We've been talking about this, this idea of turbulence in this series. It's been so amazing. Our flight attendants are, are, uh, and, uh, and our, just the immersive experience has been so, so awesome. Uh, but this idea of how we get through the turbulence in our lives, the storms in our lives, uh, how do we transcend and rise above? How do we make it through, especially during the holidays when things seem to be magnified? And so we're going to get right into it today. Our, our theme verse for this series is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. So I'm going to read it here, starting with verse 4. Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And I, I love that, that thought of always. In every circumstance, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. He said, I'll even say it again, rejoice. He said, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. So here in the, the very beginning of this, of this message, we're looking at what Paul writes to the church in, in Philippi, and he's giving this instruction to in every situation, in every circumstance, to always rejoice. And then he gives us this, this, this charge to not be anxious about anything. And, and man, anxiety is such a big deal right now in our culture and our society. And um, Pastor Jason talked about it last week. He mentioned that this generation is the most stressed out generation uh, that has ever been here, or for at least for decades. And I know what you're thinking, like all the boomers out there are like, please, you don't even know what pressure is, right? Like there's this judgmental thing about it. But the reality is, is that anxiety and stress are, are at, a, at a height, at a peak right now. And people are dealing with it in, in, a, in a great, great way. But it's, there's something comforting knowing that it's not really new, right? Like Paul wrote about it to the New Testament church. He addressed this idea of anxiety and stress. Even back then before cell phones and social media, people were still stressed out. And so Paul addresses it. He says, so don't, don't be anxious about anything. And then he gives this instruction, but in every situation, which uh, by prayer and petition, these two things, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, he gives this promise. If we'll do that, if we'll, in every situation, we'll pray and petition with thanksgiving. He said, then, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. And that word transcends really means to go rise above. That's that thought here of, of in the turbulence, if, if, a, if a pilot can, he'll try to rise above the turbulence. So this idea that the peace of God transcends, it rises above the turbulence, it rises above our comprehension, our understanding, and it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It, it guards our feelings and our thoughts when we put this order into our lives, rather than being in the storm and feeling all the things we feel and thinking all the things we feel, that if we bring it to God in every situation, our feelings and our thoughts will be guarded by the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about turbulence and how to navigate it. And this is our working definition of turbulence for this series. There it is, the warning sign. Please fasten your seatbelts. Turbulence, the definition for, for turbulence for this series is a rough patch you have to go through to get where you need to be. A rough patch you have to go through to get where you need to be. It is, it is the idea of, of every storm in life, God will not deliver you out of. And I know that that's what we want. Like when we pray, we're like, God, take me out of the storm. We're like, you know, praying like we're in force. God, please, God, make me a bird so I can fly, fly away. Like we want out of the storm. Like get us out, get us out. But sometimes God wants us to stay in and get us through. And so how we handle it, how we navigate that is, is crucial. And so we have to understand what God wants us to do in order to get us through the storm. Now, Pastor Alicia and I, we're from Southern California. We're SoCal people. But we lived in Tennessee for about 15 years. And Pastor Alicia worked in the studios there. And she was a, a background vocalist and a producer. And, and, and we lived there. And when we first moved uh, to a suburb there of Nashville, we're in this little farm town. And we were renting this place on the lake. And, and we're there fixing it up. It was all run down and overgrown. And we're, we're fixing it up. We've got the radio on. And we're painting. And we're cleaning, getting ready to move into this, this house. And, and this storm hits. Like we start hearing the thunder and, and then the, the rain. And... And if you've never been back east, like rain back east is different than rain in California. Like the, the, the drops are bigger. The, the, the wet is wetter. I, I don't understand. 
how it works, but like one time we were, we were at a, a, a Walmart Supercenter and we parked way out in the distance and we're walking to the Supercenter and we hear the thunderclap and all of a sudden it just goes boom. And, and so we're running as, and we were literally, our socks were wet, like by the time we got into the store. And so it's just different. And so we're there, we're working, we're from California, we don't know what we're doing. And the storm is, is blowing and, and pouring and the, the sky turns dark. And, and, and the upstairs part of the house, the living area, made a living area, uh, we had uh, floor to ceiling glass windows over the deck looking over the, 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 the trees and the, and the water. And we walk up to the windows and we're watching the storm. And it's me and my wife and, and some of her family and, and, and our little nephew. And like at one point, one tree goes this way and another tree goes that way. And I remember thinking, that's not right. <laughs> and... And this, this hesitation, like this like trepidation started to kind of well up inside of me. And I realized we're probably not in a good, safe place right now. And all of a sudden there was this boom and this loud boom and the whole house shook. And we all like jumped back and started running down the stairs down to the lower level of the house. We all left my four-year-old nephew standing <laughs> in front of the window. My wife, Pastor Alicia, the only one, the, the, the mighty Aunt Ia, she, she ran and grabbed him. Mom and Dad and me, we were all downstairs, and she's rescuing our, our nephew. Like, we just left him. We're like, you can make more. You're on your own. I don't know. <laughs> so it died down, and we finally came out from our shelter, and we went outside, and a massive tree had fallen over the top of the house and broke through the roof, and it was just devastation and destruction everywhere. There was debris, the, the roads were covered, power lines were down. It, it was insane. And we're just standing out there in awe, looking around. And one of the neighbors comes out and we said, what happened? And he said, oh, a, a tornado touched down. And we all looked at each other and went, yeah! And we high-fived each other. And we're like, we survived our first tornado! <laughs> and the neighbor looked at us like we were the biggest idiots in the world. And he wasn't wrong, but, but, but check it out. That day, 150 tornadoes touched down in that area. It was one of the greatest storms that that community, Rivergate, Nashville, Tennessee area, had seen in decades. And it was mass destruction. We heard about it for, for days and weeks and months as they rebuilt and, and homes wiped out, businesses. It was, it was unbelievable, the intensity of that storm. And I was thinking about that as I was studying this, like the level of the storms we go through and, like, and what really grips us and, and how we have fear. Like when we first moved back to Tennessee, they were like, you guys have earthquakes out there. That's crazy. And I'm like, earthquakes are easy. You just kind of wait. You're like, oh, yeah, it's going to stop. It's going to stop. No, it's not going to. Okay, no, it did. Okay, okay. Like we don't even get up for earthquakes, right? Like we're so used to it. We're like, oh, it's shaking. It's shaking. It's shaking. Should I get up? No, I don't. okay, we're good. And that's how we respond to earthquakes. Like, we're so used to it. Tornadoes were terrifying to us, but, like, it's totally regular for them. And I was thinking about that with turbulence, and I was looking into, like, what turbulence really is. And it, there's actually three levels of turbulence that, that they define in the airline industry, and I wanted to share that with you today. There, there's, a, there's light intensity, there's, there's moderate, and then there's severe. Do I have that right? Yeah, okay. Light, moderate, and severe. And, and I had to Google it because it's in meters, and, and, uh, and, and I, I'm American. And so, uh, so one meter is like three feet, right? So it'll rise and drop like three feet. And, and, they, and they say, like, you won't even really notice that in an airplane. Like, you can go up and down like three feet. You won't even really notice it. It's like, and, and then there's, there's moderate, uh, which is three to six meters, which is basically like 14 feet of rise and drop. And they said, like, your, your drink will, will spill and, like, you'll hear the car shake. And you've either been on a plane or you've heard it in a movie, like, the, the rattle. And, the, and, then, and then there's severe turbulence, which is 30 meters. That's almost 100 feet rise or drop. It's 98 feet rise and drop that a plane can do suddenly. And they said, if you're not fastened, it will throw you across the cabin. It, it could major injury, even death in, in a severe storm. And I, I found that so interesting because not all storms are created equal, Right? And so sometimes we have some, some light storms in our life and like, like you know, oh, we're running late or, or the, you, know, we, you know, we let the kid borrow the car and we got in it to go to work and it's on empty and we're frustrated and <laughs> now we're going to be late to work and get in trouble because we had to gas up the car or do we risk it? Do we really know our car? Do we risk it? We don't know. And, and so 
So th those are the light little things that we deal with every day, right? Maybe our coworker annoys us and they talk to us all the time when we're trying to work and, and you're like, I've never had that problem. Well, then you're the coworker that talks too much. <laughs> and then, and sometimes there's some severe storms, right? There's some, some big stuff that we, that we go through and we face that can knock us off our feet. And in this, in this last couple of years, uh, you know, we thought COVID was going to be over a year ago, and here we are getting ready to celebrate Christmas, and, and it's still a real thing. I just read that there's been another outbreak in Europe, and, and, uh, and whatever your stance is on it, I'm not trying to get into a debate or, or dry, d dividing lines, but, but we can all agree that it exists, and, and, and more than likely, most of you in this room have, have known someone that has lost their life in these last two years, and we've suffered loss, and, uh, and those, those storms are severe. So how do we navigate that? How do we, how do we navigate the turbulence in our life when it's severe? And I, I want to look at two storms today. I want to look at two storms with the disciples. In Mark chapter 4, there's a storm where Jesus is asleep on the boat with them during the storm. And then there's a storm in Mark chapter 6 where they're in the water, in the storm, and Jesus comes walking by on the winds and the waves. And I want to look at those, and I want to show us how we respond to turbulence. And the first thing I want to do is I want to show us four ways that we respond poorly to turbulence, four wrong ways. And, and maybe you'll see some of yourself in these, maybe you'll recognize some responses here, how, how we react to, to turbulence in our lives. Uh, and, then, and then afterwards, we're going to look at four ways to respond the right way, four ways that we can posture and position ourselves to weather the storm well. So if you're taking notes today, the, the first thing that we do poorly when we suffer turbulence is that we become reactive. We become reactive. We, we respond to a situation rather than creating or controlling it. And, and it's that reactive thing that, that makes you feel frazzled all the time. It's like, uh, as soon as I get this done, then this happens. As soon as I get this kid straightened up, then this kid starts acting up. As soon as I get the bills paid, then the car breaks down. Uh, as soon as I get gas in the car, then there's a flat tire. As soon as, as, soon as I, I lose weight, I find out now I'm sick. And, and, and there's this, it feels like, it never stops. Like we can't get ahead. We can't get above water. Like there's always something happening in our lives. And as soon as we think we might get a rest or we might be able to take a breath, something else happens. And so we feel frazzled. We feel stretched. We, we're always running. We're always frustrated. We're always in this place of always reacting, reacting, reacting. There's, there's no proactiveness in our life because we're so busy reacting to every storm in our life that we're just depleted and exhausted. And this is what we see in Mark chapter 6 with the disciples. When they're, when they're heading over to the other side, it says in verse 47 of Mark chapter 6, that late that night the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake. So they're right in the thick of it, right? They're right in the middle, like they're as far away from the beginning as they are to the end. Right? So it's like, do we turn back or do we keep going forward? Because we're right in the middle of it. So they're just out there in the middle of the storm, and Jesus was alone on the land, and he saw that they were in serious trouble rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. And I thought about this idea of struggling against the wind. I thought it, it went so well with turbulence. This idea of them struggling against the wind and, and fighting the wind is like fighting an invisible enemy. Like it's impossible to win. You're just always fighting, you're always struggling, but you're not really making any headway. And it's, it, it, it leads to total and absolute frustration in our lives and exhaustion, honestly. We get depleted and exhausted. And when we're in the middle of it, like they were in the middle of the storm, we're in the middle of the lake, and, and we don't really can't get back, we can't get ahead, and we're struggling, fighting against the wind, we do the second thing, we exaggerate. Now, what I mean by that, exaggerate is not really the same as telling a lie in this instance, because we're not trying to deceive someone, but what we're doing is we're honestly deceiving ourselves. And this is such a great trick of the enemy because the, the, the working definition for exaggerate is to represent something as being larger, better, or worse than it actually is. And so when we're in the middle of the storm, we tend to exaggerate our situation to ourselves and we always think it's worse than it actually is. Because we're in it. We can't see above it. We can't see through it. Matter of fact, in both of these storms, when, if you Google like the Sea of Galilee and you look at actual pictures of the Sea of Galilee, you can see from one shoreline to the next shoreline. You can see the destination before you get in the boat. And so here they are in the middle of the storm. 
You can't see the shore when you're in the middle of the storm, but they could see the shore before they got in the boat. It was right there. It was so close, but yet when you're in it, sometimes you forget that the shore is that close, and we begin to exaggerate our situations. So in Mark chapter 4, we find that the disciples are there, and I love this in verse 38. It says that Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a pillow. Like, they're in the middle of the storm, and Jesus is catching Z's. And I love that Mark added, and he had a cushion to lay his head on, right? <laughs> like, just this detail, just let you know what was really going on. And they, were, they woke him up, and they were shouting, and they said, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we're going to drown? And I wonder if you've ever prayed that prayer to God that exhausted fighting against the wind in the middle of the storm prayer of, do you even care? Like, do you even see where I'm at? How many times have I asked? How many times have I begged? How many times have I pleaded? My, my kids are, are lost in addiction. I, I'm struggling in my health. The bills are mounting up. I have no one in my life don't you care? Where are you, God? Where are the promises of God that are yes and amen? Don't you care? And we begin to exaggerate the narrative in our life that we've been abandoned. We'll do it with our friends. We'll do it with our family. We'll share that we're going through a trial or a struggle with someone. And then the next day we look at their Instagram story and they're at a party. And we're like, they're not even praying for me. Look at all those filters. They don't... And they're not even thinking about me. They, they, they left me out and, and they didn't invite me to the thing and I wasn't in the group text. And, and we'll, we'll start exaggerating the narrative of it's on purpose because they hate me. <laughs> Don't you care? We exaggerate the narrative and what becomes reality becomes perceived reality. And perceived reality is shaped by your own thoughts and feelings and emotions. It's your truth, right? Which we know your truth isn't actually truth. Because if you have to define it as your truth, then it's not actually truth. Look up the definition, we can talk about it later. But perceived reality feels like reality. It feels like truth. And it's a hard place to be in when we feel like nobody cares, and especially God. And so we do this next thing, like we're exhausted because we've been reacting to everything. We're exaggerating the narrative. We're beginning to tell ourselves the story that's not even true. And we'll do this third thing is we'll start creating new problems. Like we'll start speaking new problems into existence because we're doing the wrong things at the wrong time for the wrong motives. And so we create these problems and that definition for creating is to bring something new into existence. And this is what happens in Mark chapter 6. Jesus is walking on the water to his disciples in verse 48. And it says about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And he intended to go past them. And I love that, and we'll come back to that in just a moment because we won't get ahead of ourselves, but dang. He intended to walk right by them in the middle of the storm. But when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. Like, these are sailors, right? These guys are fishermen. And so, like, you know, we're talking about sea monsters and, and you know, all the legends around that. This is long before airplanes and jets. And so they're out in the lake. They're, they're trying to get to the other side. They're in the middle of the storm. Fear and terror have gripped their heart. Jesus is passing by. This is their opportunity to cry out to him. And instead of understanding what is happening, they begin to create more problems by saying, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And we do the same thing when fear grips our heart, when, when anxiety grips us, when frustration and anger grips our heart. We begin to exaggerate the narrative that's going on in our lives, and we'll begin to speak things into existence that weren't really happening. Oh, they don't love me. Oh, my marriage is falling apart. There's no hope for it. Oh, there's no way my kids are going to come back to church after what happened to them. Man, I'll never get a promotion. I, my, kid, my parents should have made me go to school. I should have got that degree, and now I can't do it. I'm too busy. I got too many kids. I'm too broke. We'll never have a car that runs. I'll never be healthy. I'm sick all the time. And we start speaking this narrative into our lives and creating more problems than we ever had to begin with because we're in the thick of the storm and we cannot see clearly what God is actually doing. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. 
So what happens when we get to that place where we're, we're reacting to everything and we feel frazzled and tired and, and, and we're exaggerating the situation? It's really worse than it, than it actually is. And we start telling ourselves these lies and creating more issues than fixing problems because we're just in it all the time and we're struggling and we're rowing and we're fighting the wind instead of turning to God. This third thing or this fourth thing happens is we surrender our hope. And when we surrender our hope, it is a dangerous place to be. We cease resistance to an enemy or opponent and submit to their authority and reality when we surrender hope. We stop fighting the good fight of faith and we surrender and we say things and we think things like, I'll never find anyone. I guess I'm meant to be alone. This is as good as it's going to get. There's no place for me here. I can't make friends. And we start saying things as if they're fact because we've surrendered hope. This is what happened with the disciples in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, when they, when they exaggerated the narrative and they, they woke Jesus up. And this is the New King James Version. It says he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up and they said to him, teacher, do you not care? And listen to this, that we are perishing. Not that we're going to drown. Not that we might drown. Don't you care that we're going to die? Don't you care that we are perishing? And so they've surrendered hope to the fact of their turbulence. It's a dangerous place to be. And maybe you're there today, but this is really something that we need to understand is that in this setting, in this story, when they cry out to Jesus, Jesus was there the whole time. But they believed in the reality of their storm more than they believed in the reality of their Savior. And that's so critical that we understand whatever we're walking through today is our storm greater than our God? Because if our storm is greater than our God, then we can just surrender hope right now. But if the reality is, if you can stop for a minute in the midst of the storm and think to yourself, is God bigger than what I'm facing? No matter how great it may be, no matter how severe the turbulence, if you're dropping 100 feet at a time right now and you're getting thrown around the cabin, is God still greater than that turbulence that you're going through? And if he is, it changes how we respond. So in this, in this series, Turbulence, we've, every week we've given you a principle. Week one, uh, Pastor Jason, phenomenal message. Principle one was check your gauges. If you haven't watched that message, haven't listened to it, check it out online. It's such a great, great message. Last week, another phenomenal message. The principle was to put your oxygen mask on first. Another phenomenal message. T today is principle three. There's the bell. Trust the flight plan. Trust the flight plan. See, Jesus gave the plan. He, he'd already put it in place. And, and, and it, if we trust God's plan, it changes how we weather the storms. And so going back to, the, to Mark chapter 6 for just a moment, like I was talking about, they're in the middle of the storm, and Jesus sees them from shore, and he sees that they're struggling. And he's walking on the water as they're in the storm, and the Bible says that he, his plan was to walk by them. Like he was going to pass them by. In Mark chapter 4, they're in the middle of the storm, and Jesus isn't rowing with them. He's sleeping in the back of the boat. Why, why would Jesus be asleep in the storm? Why would he walk by them in the storm? Is it because Jesus is just savage like that? Is it, is it because Jesus doesn't care? Is it because he's unaware that they are struggling? See, we have to understand Jesus' reaction here because a lot of times if we're in the storm and we read these stories, we can feel a way about those two actions. Oh, how dare you walk by? Don't you care? Are you, are you even, hello up there, are you hearing my prayers or are you asleep? Jesus, take the wheel, like what, what's going on here? And we can feel a way because we're not seeing clearly to understand how to trust the plan. And, and here's the reality, is that God does not operate in our timeline. He exists outside of time. So if you can just hear me for a minute and understand this, when God speaks, it exists. It's not getting ready. For you and I, we're like, we're waiting for it to happen. God said it, it's going to happen. But when God said it, it already happened for him. Time is done. So, so when he gives the plan, he's moving on because he already knows the outcome. And so when we understand that, it changes how we weather the storm. So check this out in Mark chapter 6, the beginning of this story. So what happened in Mark chapter 6 was crazy. 
uh, Jesus took the disciples aside to spend some time with them, and the multitude followed him. And so then he's teaching the multitude, and it gets late in the day, and they have no money, and they're hungry, and the disciples are annoyed, and they're like, Jesus, send them away to get something to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them. And they're like, Jesus, we don't have enough money to feed 5,000 people, and there's like one kid here with a little lunch, and that's it. So like, they need to go. And Jesus takes this five loaves and these two fish, he prays over it, he blesses it, he gives it to the disciples, feed 5,000 people. Then, as soon as he feeds 5,000 people, he tells them, get in the boat and go over to the other side. So this is where we pick this up. In verse 45 of Mark chapter 6, immediately after feeding the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. So Jesus speaks to them. He says, get in the boat and go to Bethsaida. It exists. Boom. It's done. Jesus said it. It's going to happen. In Mark chapter 4, this other storm, verse 35, how this one started. On the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Boom, he spoke it, it now exists. This is the plan. It's going to happen. But when we're in the storm, sometimes it's hard to remember the promise that God made. But if we understand that God's plan will not be thwarted by anything that we face in this life, that what he said will come to pass, we can weather the storm. So how? How do we position ourselves to weather the storm? I'm sweating, my mic's coming off, give me a second. Online, there you go. That'll be a highlight moment for the Instagrams. Yeah. For the YouTubes. Yeah. So how do we weather the storm? How do, we, how do we navigate it in such a way that we're not reacting, that we're not exaggerating, that we're not, uh, that we're, that we're not frustrated and depleted of hope? How do, we, how do we prepare ourselves ahead of time so that when the storm comes, we're ready for it? So we're going to look at some of Jesus' responses here and some of his instructions Four right ways to respond to turbulence in our lives. Four right ways to respond to turbulence in our lives. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one is that we must believe up. Believe up. It all begins and ends with our faith. That's, that's the crux. When you read the New Testament scriptures and you, you read the instructions of Christ, it all begins and ends with faith. The whole point of the journey is our faith. Amen. The whole point of the storm is our faith. The whole point of the promise is our faith. Everything and anything that God does in our lives is surrounded and centered on our faith. Our faith is our belief in Christ Jesus. So we must believe up. We can't keep believing in the storm. We can't keep believing in the wind. We can't keep believing in the situation. We can't be keep believing in the report. We must believe that God said it so it must happen and come to completion. So we believe up. Mark chapter 6 verses 51 and 52. I love this. They're in the storm. They cry out to Jesus. And then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves and the fish, and their hearts were hardened. And I thought that was such a weird verse in this scripture. Like, the fish and loaves, they fed the 5,000. There's a storm. Jesus gets in the boat. He calms the wind and the waves. And, they, and then they said, and by the way, they didn't understand the fish and the loaves. So I, I researched that the last couple of weeks of like, why is that in there? Like, help me understand that, God, of like, like what is the reason for that? And, and really what we see here is, is that it, it references a name of God. Uh, it's it's El, El Shaddai. And it's, it's a name of God. God has many, many names in the Bible. And, and El Shaddai is, is one of those names, and it means God Almighty, all-sufficient one. And it's important that we know the names of God because it helps us define who God is in our lives. And, and he's, he's God Almighty and all-sufficient one. And so Jesus here takes his disciples on this journey to feed the 5,000. And he could have caused manna to fall from heaven. He could have gave them roast chicken, whatever. Jesus could have done anything he wanted. He could have sent them all home to eat, whatever he wanted to do. But instead, he let the disciples go through this journey of taking what didn't seem like nearly enough and making it more than you could possibly comprehend. Because he wanted them to understand that that they serve God Almighty, the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai. And so El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one, that he wants them to understand this principle. So now they're immediately in a storm and they've lost all hope. Because they did not understand what Jesus was trying to teach them is that in every circumstance, every situation, whether it's mild turbulence, like there's not enough food for lunch, or it's major turbulence, we're going to drown, that God is all-sufficient. 
So what does that mean for you and I? It means that El Shaddai is our God. The, he's God Almighty. He's in charge. He has authority. And he's all sufficient to meet every single need in every situation. I love what Jesus did in Mark chapter 6, verses 41 through 44, during feeding the 5,000. They gathered the five loaves and the two fish, right? Like he says to them, okay, let's use that. Like, okay. And I feel this way sometimes. I'm like, okay, God, here's my little lunch. What do you want to do with it? And Jesus, he looked up to heaven. He believed up. He looked up to heaven. He looked to the Father, the all-sufficient one, and he blessed and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people and the two fish he divided, divided among them all. And I love, I love this, this final verse here. So they all ate and were filled. Like Thanksgiving dinner, unbuckle your belt, sit in the lounge chair, turn on the TV, start snoring, full. Like everyone was filled to capacity. You know you're excited about Thanksgiving. Don't even lie to me. You're already smelling the turkey and the pumpkin pie. Whatever. Like you're all quiet. I don't know about Thanksgiving. You liars. Gluttons. <laughs> You're not even going to watch the parade. You're just going to sleep. <clears throat> this is how full they were. Everyone had ate their fill. And then, after everyone was stuffed to the max and taking in their afternoon naps, the disciples collected 12 huge baskets filled with leftovers. We serve God Almighty, all sufficient one. I like to call him the God of leftovers. <laughs> He said, you didn't understand because your hearts were hardened about the all-sufficient one. You didn't have an understanding, so in the storm, you were lost. And this is what I want us to understand, that we have to have a clear vision of God's plan. And without a clear vision, your life is wasted. But with a clear vision, you are a force to be reckoned with. And so if you've been wondering why you're running and frazzled and, and feeling depleted, it's because maybe you don't understand God's plan for your life. So we got to believe up. And if we're believing up, then we need to do the second thing. We need to fight up. We need to fight up. We're fighting the wrong things. We're fighting the wrong way. We're fighting with the wrong weapons. We, we've got it all mixed up. Believe it or not, your fight is not with your spouse. Believe it or not, your fight is not with your kids. Your fight is not with your neighbor who won't mow their lawn. Your fight is not with the neighbor that just turned their Christmas lights but left them, on, left them up from last year. That's not who your fight is with. And don't blame COVID. I know you've been up for the last five years, so whatever. You know who you are. You never take your Christmas lights down. You don't have a ladder. Okay, whatever. They got up there somehow. Whatever. That's... You don't have to try to defend yourself. It's okay. We're live. <laughs> that's, that's not who we're fighting. That's not who we're fighting. We need to remember that our fight is not against our neighbor. We need to start fighting the right fight. So look what Jesus did in Mark 4.39. He woke up, important part there, in the storm, and he rebuked the wind and spoke to the waves and said, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. I love that. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And so Jesus addresses two things here. He addresses the storm and he addresses the faith. Again, it all begins and ends with faith. So he fights the right fight. And the fight is the storm and the faith. Right? And that's the fight that we have to fight. And I love this word rebuke. It's kind of like a, an old church Biblical word, don't hear it a lot in church nowadays, this word rebuke. But when you do a word study on it, it's actually a fighting term. It means to strike at, to throw a punch, to rebuke, to strike something. And so there are times in our lives where we need to rebuke some things. We need to throw a punch, not to your neighbor, not to your spouse, not right now especially, but maybe to the enemy of our souls. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against Satan. It's against the enemy of our soul who is searching to destroy us. We've forgotten who we are. We don't know God's plan. And so we're fighting the wrong fights. We're fighting the win when we should be fighting the enemy. We need to rebuke some things in our lives. Start rebuking some things in your life. Pastor Jason last week rebuked the laundry, right? I don't know if that's the right rebuke or not, but it was funny. But start rebuking some things in your life. Start rebuking some, some strife and some stress in your life. Start speaking out and speaking the word over some things in your life. Start fighting the right fight with the right weapons. 
and see what God does. I love what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He said that we don't fight against flesh and blood. That's not who we're battling. He said, but, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen worlds, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Our battle is a spiritual battle. It's a different fight than the world's fight. And in Philippians chapter 4, our theme verse, what, what Paul tells us is he says, in every situation, pray and petition. Yes. These two words. And when you really look up that word prayer, it is, it is prosuke. And prosuke is different than just like saying words to God. Prosuke is, is more of like a posture, an offering. It is setting, setting aside a time and a place to pray. It is, it is setting that prayer closet. It is getting on your knees. It is waking up a little bit earlier to, to spend time in prayer, to actually calendar and carve out time that you are offering to God. It changes your heart position. I'll, I'll just let you know I get up about 5.30 every morning, and I know some of you get up earlier than that. That's super early for me, especially now. It's like super dark. And, and I, I make a coffee, and I go pray. This is my rhythm every morning. I make a coffee and I go pray. I grab my word, I turn on some worship, and I spend some time praying before anything else in my day. I, I've made this, carved out this time, it's an offering to the Lord. Sometimes it's a sacrifice when that alarm goes off. And sometimes I have to drag myself up. But I get up and I do it because I'm posturing myself to, to make a time and a place to encounter God's presence to let the Holy Spirit fill my life, to direct my steps so that I can follow his directions throughout the day. And then Paul says to petition. And that's sometimes we confuse like that prayer is petition. Like oh, we should just, all prayers asking God for stuff. And we have our list, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, amen. And, and, and that's okay, if you're praying that way, that's okay. You'll, you'll grow, you'll grow. But petition is actually asking, seeking, and knocking. It is this desire for more of God, getting deeper, pushing in, and so that we position ourselves to pray and to seek, to soak in the presence of God. And it changes how we fight. I, I love Corey Ten Boom, uh, this, this question she asked, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? When we learn how to fight up, it changes how we pray. Changes how we pray. And so then when, when we believe up and we fight up, we do this third thing, we speak up. And I've got I've to hurry. We speak up. This is important. This is important that we understand the difference between how we're fighting our battles right now and how we address them. When Jesus was getting ready to start his ministry on earth, he was baptized and, by John the Baptist and God the Father opened the heavens and he spoke audibly, affirming Jesus as his son whom he was well pleased with. And then the Holy Spirit, as a form of a dove, came down and ascended on Jesus. And, and everyone witnessed this moment where he was affirmed for who he was as the savior of the world, the sacrificial lamb, the son of God. And then the Bible says that immediately the spirit uh, put him and, and drove him to the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus prayed in the wilderness before he began his ministry. And there's an epic battle between him and Satan there where Satan's trying to tempt him, trying to thwart him from God's plan so he doesn't have a clear understanding of God's plan for his life, trying to get him to, to get sidetracked and derailed in the turbulence. And Jesus uses the word. He fights the enemy. God encounters him. The angels come and minister him. And he comes down from that mountain after 40 days of an encounter with God, putting God first. And he goes to the synagogue and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And he opens it up to chapter 41, what we know as chapter 41. And he reads these words in Luke 4, 18 and 19. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of the sight of the blind. To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That word proclaim means to preach or to be a herald. And to be a herald, like maybe you haven't heard that word, but like you sing it at Christmas, hark the herald angels sing. Yeah, I'm on the worship team. Um, <laughs> it, it means to be like almost prophetic, like to bring a message, a prophetic word, to let them know what's getting ready to come. And so sometimes we have to proclaim some things. Sometimes we need to speak up. Sometimes we need to look in the mirror and preach to ourselves and say, it doesn't look like it today. But I'm going to be all right. God's going to see me through. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know where. But God is all sufficient and he is almighty. And he will carry me through this. 
Sometimes we got to preach to ourselves, amen to ourselves, high five ourselves, take our own offering and say, yes, Lord, it's going to be a good day. Sometimes we got to preach to ourselves. Sometimes we got to speak up over our family and over our marriage and over our finances and over our business and begin to proclaim some promises over them as if they had already come to pass, even in the midst of the storm. And here's the reality. If you don't speak up, someone else will speak for you. Someone else will speak over your family, over your marriage, over your life. If you don't speak up, someone is going to speak for you. I love it in the storm when they're in the midst of it in Mark chapter 6 and Jesus is walking by and they're terrified and they say to him, it's a ghost. I love in verse 50, Jesus immediately spoke to them and said, take care, courage, it is I, do not be afraid. I love this idea that, that Jesus immediately spoke to the fear that they were suffering. He said, don't be afraid. I know you're in the storm, but I'm here. I'm in the boat. I'm getting in the boat. I'm with you right now. Whatever storm you're facing right now, maybe you've been reacting, maybe you've been struggling, maybe you've been exaggerating the narrative, maybe you've begun to just give up all hope. But I want you to know that today Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. Take courage. God Almighty, all sufficient one is with you. El Shaddai, I'm here. I'm with you. When his disciples cried out, Jesus climbed in. When you cry out, Jesus will climb in. I want to give you this verse before the last fill in. Verse 51 of Mark chapter 6, he climbed in the boat. And the wind died down, and they were completely amazed. Jesus is there. So here's what you have to do today, this fourth thing. If you're in the storm, if you don't know where to turn, all you got to do is look up. Look up right now in this moment. Look up. Look up. Your family's falling apart and you don't know what to do. Just stop and look up. Your marriage is disintegrating, and it doesn't seem like every time you try to fix it, it just gets worse. Look up. The doctors keep giving you a bad report. It doesn't seem like there's any hope. It just seems to be getting worse no matter how much medicine you take, no matter how much you try. You don't know what to do. Look up. Look up. I love what David said in Psalms 121, 1 and 2. He said, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. I look, where does my help come from? And then he realizes, my help comes from the Lord the all-sufficient one, the maker of heaven and earth. Your help is here today. You call out, he'll climb in. Would you bow your heads this morning, close your eyes, everybody in this place. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Jesus, and not because of maybe something I said, but because you feel in your heart that you need to make that decision today. You're gonna have that opportunity here in just a moment. Just to simply, maybe you've been running your own play, working your own plan, and you've been working and fighting against the wind, and you are exhausted, and you know it's time to surrender to God's plan. To let Jesus be Lord of your life. To ask him to climb in the boat with you. Maybe you're here today, and, and you are a believer, but you've fallen away like you've you, you forgot who God is and you've been struggling and fighting and you've given into despair and fear and anxiety and you just need to make that recommitment today and say, you, you are my savior, but, but today I need you to be Lord. I need you to, to put out the plan to get in the boat. If that's you this morning, I'm not gonna embarrass you or single you out or, or call you up to the front while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Me, you, and God right now in this moment. I'm gonna count to three. I just want you to put your hand up in the air. One, God's dealing with your heart. You need to make that decision today. Two, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Three, if that's you, put your hand up right now. Just keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Keep it up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sis. God bless you. God bless you. Keep them up for me. Keep them up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, young man. God bless you. In the back there, God bless you, sir. You can put them back down. Would you just quietly say this prayer? Say it out loud with me. Dear Jesus. I invite you to be Lord of my life. I surrender my plan for your plan. Come into my life. Step into the boat. 
Step into the storm. I need you, God. I surrender my will, my desire. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be Lord. I give you my heart. I give you my storm. I give you all that I am. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray, Lord, over each and every person in this place. God, as they've made that decision, as they're surrendering to you, as they're facing storms in their life, Lord, as they've been struggling, they feel depleted, God, they don't know which way to turn, I pray, God, right now, Lord, that you would climb in the boat, that you would go right where they're at, that you'd meet them in their storm, that they would feel your comfort, your spirit, your grace, that you would sustain them, that you would remind them that you are God Almighty, all-sufficient for every situation. God, I pray, Lord, you restore marriages and families and set people free from addiction, Lord God, that you would, Lord God, resurrect people, Lord God, from their debt and poverty, Lord God, that you would help those in need, Lord God, that you would pour out your power and your presence in this moment, that you would rebuke the wind and the waves. You are God Almighty, El Shaddai, all-sufficient one. We thank you for it. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord